bless you when you're listening to the word of the Lord. Um, this morning, let us reflect on the Holy Gospel reading, St. Mark, the first chapter, for a moment. Please uh, sit back and relax. Uh, let us enjoy the listening to the word of the Lord. Um, let me begin with sharing uh, an interesting story about an animal this morning. Is there anyone who knows what kind of animal it is? A lemur. A lemur. Okay, something like that. <laughs> Actually, the exact name is ringed tail, uh, ring tail monkey. Okay. Ring tail monkey. It's a, it looks a little big on the screen, but actually it's a pretty small one, but very agile, and also a little cute too. They are living in Africa. Um, the story is like this. Men who trap animals in Africa for Jews in America say that one of the hardest animals to catch is this ring-tailed monkey. For the Zulu people in Southern Africa, however, it is very simple. They've been catching this agile little animal with ease for years. The method the Zulus use is based on knowledge of the animal. Their trap is just nothing more than a kind of big melon growing on a vine. The seeds of this melon are a favorite, very favorite of the monkey. Knowing this, the Zulu people simply cut a hole in the melon, just large enough for the monkeys to insert his hand to reach the seeds inside. The monkey will stick his hand in, grab as many seeds as he can, then start to withdraw it. This but he cannot do it. His fist is now larger than the hole. The monkey will pull and talk, screech, and fight the melon for hours, but he cannot get free of the trap unless he gives up the seeds, which he refuses, which he refuses to do. Meanwhile, the Zulu people just sneak up so that's the way they catch this ring-tailed monkey with ease. It's so easy for them, but if we don't know how to catch them, then it's very hard to catch because they are small, very agile, but very fast. <coughs> the temptation of very delicious melon is irresistible for this ring-tailed monkey. And as we heard, the result of the falling and temptation is not good at all. This morning, in our Gospel lesson from St. Mark, it's about, the Gospel is about temptation, temptation of Jesus Christ in the wilderness. St. Mark leaves out many of the details <coughs> which St. Luke and St. Matthew in their Gospels, but then it gives us a chance to do it on the key concept of this event. The key concept of this event recorded in St. Mark, which is our Gospel lesson this morning, is that Jesus was tempted, but he was completely successful for not to fall into temptation. So that was the idea, that was the concept. After Jesus' baptism, St. Mark's Gospel says, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And then Jesus was left alone there, and he was tempted. And temptation, always temptations are very sweet. So one of the famous quotes about temptation is like this. Always free cheese is available in mousetrap. Yes, it's a free cheese. But 
the mouse are tempted and when they catch it, then the result is not good at all for them. So that is temptation. Temptation comes very in a very sweet way. So temptation is like that picture too. And always behind the temptation, the main character is the devil, Satan. And that Satan tempts us through our human sinful nature. Jesus Christ left this place of unreal and went into the real world where the common people reside. The world of temptation, the world of sin, and God wanted to see if Jesus Christ would do what was required of him, to see if Jesus would reject sin and follow the path to the cross. Now it is Lenten season. We began the Lenten season in 2015, last Wednesday, which was Ash Wednesday, and this is 40 days of spiritual journey. During this journey, we focus on Jesus Christ's suffering for us. Jesus Christ didn't deserve anything for the punishment. He was perfect. He was tempted, but he got over perfectly. But he was punished on the cross. He suffered on the cross just for our sins. So with that, during this Lenten season, we focus on meditating the suffering of Jesus Christ, and also we focus on repentance for our sins. So these are the symbols of the Lenten season. What are these? Son of a crown, a crown of sons, and also nails. What do you feel when you see those symbols? Actually, those are not the symbols. Actually, Jesus Christ wore that crown, and also his hands and his feet were pierced by those nails. So whenever I see those things, <coughs> those make me shudder with a lot of pain on my body. Let is the time for the focusing on meditation, on the suffering of Jesus Christ for us. We follow as he is tempted, as the devil tries to convince Jesus Christ to, to steer away from this course of undeserved suffering and death. We see Jesus Christ that comes through this period of temptation with his face renewed. Along the way, we see Jesus Christ sets his face, and we see those who would minister to him as he faces the cross of Mount Calvary. Then, that brings us to the question, what does temptation mean for us? Are we tempted in the same way as Jesus was tempted? Yes. The answer is yes. We are tempted. We are tempted by all the sinfulness of this world to turn away from what is required of us by God. So even though we try, we try to be faithful to the Lord, like Him, still the temptation of this world comes to us each and every day. And then, <clears throat> what are those that are required of us by God? Actually, <clears throat> that is very simple. But at the same time, it is the most difficult because of our human sinful nature. We are required to follow <clears throat> the two great commandments. Jesus speaks about those two great commandments in the scriptures in Mark chapter 12, verse 28. He says, 
And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart and with your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. Actually, these two great, two great commandments are pretty simple. Loving our God with our whole heart, our all, all, all our soul, and with all our strength. It doesn't require PhD degree, or it doesn't require master's degree, it doesn't require to be bilingual, it doesn't require any money, and yet, at the same time, it may be the most difficult for us to do, because we are, we are not perfect, we are very limited by our human sinful nature. <clears throat> and we always fail, almost each and every day we fail to love our Lord with our whole strength. And also we fail to love the people around us. Our commandments that are given by Jesus Christ to follow are simple and yet very tough. That is what is required of us, nothing more and nothing less. But the temptation of this world leads us to follow other gods, the god of self, the god of power, the god of greed, the god of money, the god of fun, the god of pleasure. The other gods of this world tempt us to ignore our God, His Church, and the people around us. The temptation, <clears throat> the temptation of this world are all around us, each and every day. We are, as Father Martin Luther says, saints and sinners at the same time. As we see, <clears throat> The picture on the screen is to be like this. We are half saint, we are half sinner. Saints because of the saving power and saving grace of Jesus Christ, and we are sinners because we don't always do what is required of us, required of us by God. We were sinners before our baptism, who deserved the eternal punishment. But in our baptism, we became saints on whom the invisible garment of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ is given and worn over us, being adopted as the precious children of God. We were completely washed, we were completely forgiven, and we were fully accepted by God in our baptism. But the problem is that after that, we go back to the status of sinners. So that's why we are half saints, we are half sinners, like the person on the screen. <coughs> Let me share one just um, short story. <coughs> I found a distant relative in the Great Bank area, and she is a rich woman, so that um, after she drives up the exactly same car as this one, in the exactly same color. Um, well, that's a beautiful car, but I do not have it. Well, number one, I don't have that, that much money, but also I'm not a big fan of this car. Why? Um, let me share. Um, because my um, relative drives this car, um, actually she spent way too much money on the car, I think. 
Um, <clears throat> for the regular maintenance and oil change, she always go. She always goes to the uh, Mercedes Benz dealership. And uh, just one oil change and regular maintenance was one thousand dollars. My car, small Toyota. It costs only about forty-five dollars for oil change and trip, you know, um, maintenance. That's all. So to compare with my car, <coughs> way way too expensive to to keep. So every time, whenever she brings this car to the Mercedes Benz dealership, she spends over thousand dollars for oil change and regular maintenance. Oil change and regular maintenance. And also, because it's a nice looking luxurious car, she doesn't want. She doesn't want. She does want to have a third Mercedes Benz. So once or twice, she brings it to car wash. Like that. Obviously, she doesn't want to do because it's a time-consuming work. You know, it's a hard job. So she brings it once or twice every day. And um, with that, she spends a lot of money. But I think that she doesn't really realize that a car is a car. To me, a car is just a car. A car is like a shoe, that's all. A car is not a house to me, but I guess to some people, a car is like a sort of a house. So that they want to have a luxurious one, they want to keep it so nicely and neatly and things like that. But to me, a car is like a shoe. So, with that, I don't spend money on cars, and I don't bring uh, my cars to car wash. Just once in a while, I just uh, uh, wash uh, my car mm. with the water, and then I just uh, vacuum the inside of the car. That's about it. Because if you want to keep your car so clean all the time, then actually you have to clean up your car every day. Every day. Do you want to do that? No, I don't want to do it either. In fact, we are like cars. Even though we were washed and cleansed beautifully and perfectly in our baptism, we get dirty again and again by following many temptations in this world. But our good Lord, always willing to wash, to wash us again and again and to accept again and again as long as we are so willing to be washed and cleansed by Him through the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, the sacrament of the Holy Absolution, repentance and prayer. So this is our Lord's job and we are cars. He washes us every time whenever we come to Him through the sacraments, through prayers. As the car washing machine or car washers clean, uh, cleanses our car, our Lord washes our sins. And then He pours down His love, caring, and power onto you and onto me again and again so that we may keep going our journey here with Him to life everlasting. During this Lenten season, we focus on repentance for our sins. Yes, I know you are good people in the community, but still, in the perspective of God, we are sinners. Why? Because we always fail to love our God with our whole heart, our whole our strength. So that's why we are sinners. And also we fail to love our spouse, our children, our friends, and all the people around us as ourselves. So we focus on repentance, self-reflection, and prayer during this Lenten season. And the reason and meaning of Christ's suffering for us. And during this Lenten season, we make more effort.
to drown our human sinful nature in the water of holy baptism every day and to be born again with Christ every day. So every morning, every day, every time, whenever you <coughs> make sign of the cross in remembrance of baptism, actually you drown yourself into the holy water of baptism and you tie up yourself on the cross. So I hope that you and I can do this like him during the season. I think that's a very beautiful picture. He's kneeling down before the altar and he's praying. Looks like he's focusing on repentance. So that should be our picture during the Lenten season and also the rest of the year every day. Why? Because our Christian life is the life of a life of kneeling down. We kneel down before the Lord for prayers. We kneel down before Him because He is our Master. We kneel down before Him because He is our real Father. We kneel down before him every day because he is the owner of your life, your soul, your body, your possession. So I hope that you and I can keep doing this each and every day as a faithful Christian that also through that we meet our Lord every day. We receive his power and grace every day. Let us remember, the more empty our hearts, the more grace of Jesus Christ we can receive. So I hope that you and I can do that. And let's try to do that. May the Lord which bless you on your living down all the time. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding give your heart and mind in Jesus Christ our Savior, both now and forever. Amen.